Hello everyone, I'm the Saxy Gamer. Today we're here to go over the patch notes for the Spring 2018 update patch that's going to be released tomorrow. Um, the patch notes have just come out and I'm going to go over some of the main points from them. I'm not going to go over every single point, but I will make sure to link the patch notes in the description below if you want to see everything. Um, so let's go ahead and get into things. So first up we have new additions, so just some uh, new features that are going to be added to the game. Uh, first up we have that Joint Wars can now be declared using a Casas Belly, which uh, I think that's very nice. Because Joint Wars were pretty terrible because you would only be able to declare or surprise war so you would get huge warmonger penalties and it was terrible um, in addition we also have that uh, AI can now be asked to join an ongoing war which I think is also really nice because if you know someone declares a surprise war on you and you're not expecting it maybe you can get one of your allies in on it you know maybe they're not your ally but they're like a friend of yours um, you can get them in on the war and maybe you can then uh, like retaliate and take a few cities of whoever tried to attack you um, or maybe if you're just struggling to you know like finish someone off or something you can have the nearest neighbor try to uh, join in on the war as well and and it, I think it just should be a lot more fun, and you can play around with the AI a lot more using these new wars, um, especially since you can do this uh, using Costa's Belly as well. Uh, so you're not going to be getting crushed by Warmonger penalties. You can kind of do a lot of fun stuff with that. So I think it's a very nice addition. Um, in addition uh, to this, we also have that uh, there have been 12 new historic moments added for the mid to late game. Um, it's not a huge addition. Uh, I'm not going to go over what they all are. Um, but I do think it is nice just because, it's, especially in like the mid slash late game, they, they, there are a lot of instances where it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to get era score unless you are like able to get either a ton of trade routes or a bunch of spies or something like that. Just because the, uh, the, the the, the dedications for the the later eras don't uh, like they're not as easy to get era score from as uh, as the ones in like the ancient and classical era um, so I, I do think that more historic moments is always a good thing uh, so those are the uh, the new additions uh, moving on let's go ahead and talk about some of the balance changes uh, so first up we have some some governor changes so we have that uh, pingala's first ability now provides plus 15 percent science and culture and that's down from plus 20 percent um, I don't know if that's necessarily like all that like, or like, I'm not sure if that was even that necessary of a change, because I didn't think that Pingala was too overpowered, um, but I guess 15% science and culture is a little bit more reasonable than plus 20%, especially in the late game, whenever you could get, you can get a ridiculous amount of science by having an additional plus 20% science. Um, and then the really big one, uh, Magnus's first ability now provides 50% shot bonuses, um, and that was at 100%. <laughs> it makes me so, so sad, because Magnus was just so good. He was so cheese. You could rush wonders in, like, three turns with Magnus and like a bunch of woods, um, but now yeah, you're only beating uh, plus 50% bonuses to your chop yields, um, which is half of what it used to be. Uh, I think this is it's a very necessary change. They had to do that because Magnus was totally overpowered, especially in the early game. Like you could build the Oracle in like two turns. You could build any wonder you wanted in the early game in like two or three turns if you had chops available. Um, so it is a very good change, <laughs> although it does make me a little bit sad. And we also have some changes to governments, um, so communism production per population has been raised from uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, and in addition, um, it also now provides plus 15% production in all cities uh, instead of the, the plus 10 that it did provide. Um, I think this is very good, it does, it makes communism a lot more of like a production focused thing, uh, it's, it makes it very good for a science victory, especially considering the next change. Um, so democracy production um, has been lowered from plus 2 production per district to plus 1 per district. Um, um, I think this is another very good change because democracy and communism are almost like equally valuable in their uh, in like their focus on production. Um, but democracy was honestly, I think, a little bit better than communism just because of the policy cards you got. Um, but now that democracy provides less production, I, th I think it's a little bit better in that you don't have to, you know, if you if you want the maximum production, um, you would definitely pick communism. If and you know, if you were going for like a, a culture victory or something like that, where you wanted you know certain uh, certain policy card slots, then you would pick democracy. So I think. I think both of these are a little bit more specialized now, and I think that is quite a good thing. Um, we also have that fascism um, has had an increase to the, the bonus combat strength, so it's been raised from plus 4 to plus 5, so um, plus 1 more combat strength isn't really going to change too much. Um, but this is a pretty big part. Uh, unit production bonus has been increased from plus 20% to plus 50%, so that is actually quite insane. Um, getting plus 50% production whenever you're producing units, that's that's really good, especially you know if you're in the late game and you, maybe you need to quickly just build up a huge army to go take someone out. Um, that could be That could be very helpful. So I, I think that is a good change. I don't know if I've actually ever even used fascism in a game, um, but maybe I will now just because that actually sounds pretty decent. Um, we also have some changes to some uh, some policies. Um, 
there were three policies changed, but this is the only one that I thought was like all that um like impactful. So uh, e-commerce now gives plus two gold and plus two production from all trade routes, um, and this has changed from plus um from plus ten gold and plus five production, but only for international trade routes. Um, I think that this is a good thing. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, e-commerce was almost like a little bit overpowered because if you had 10 trade routes and you were sending them all internationally, then you'd be getting an additional plus 100 gold per turn and 50 production, which is, that's 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 a so much. Um, but now, you know, it gives a little bit less um, and it also benefits internal trade routes as well. So I do like that change because uh, you can use internal trade routes even a little bit more um, and they're still pretty viable for gold in the late game if you're doing that. So I think I think this is a good change as well. Um, moving on, we have some changes to some sieves um, and their abilities. So we have that Pax Britannica, so England, uh, now gives an additional melee unit whenever a Royal Navy dockyard is constructed. Um, I guess this is good, but like, it's, <laughs> I don't think it's really going to change too much about England, because England, uh, England's not great as is, and uh, this seems a little bit too specific <laughs> to make them really all that great. Um, just because, you know, if you're founding a new city, you'll get that first melee unit, and then whenever you build your Royal Navy Dockyard, then you'll get another melee unit, but, like, are, are you really gonna need that? Like, <laughs> is, is, is that one melee unit really gonna be all that impactful upon what you're doing in the game? Probably not, but, I mean, I guess it is nice nonetheless. Um, we also have for the Mapuche, Swift Talk now makes pillaging tiles cause the city to lose five loyalty. Um, I think this is a nice change. I, I'm not sure if 5 is quite enough. I kind of wish it was... I, I, I want to say I wish it was 10, but 10 might be a little bit overpowered. But um, losing 5 loyalty um, from pillaging tiles, that, that, that'll that be very useful, especially on, you know, uh, cities that are on, like, the edge of a civilization that aren't going to have that strong, like, population loyalty per turn. Um, this could be good. It, like, you might actually be able to flip a city uh, before you take it. So maybe this could make Swift Talk a little bit better. Uh, because I do consider it to be quite a weak ability. Um... Unless, there, there, there are very few situations where Swift Talk can be good, but uh, this might make it a little bit, um, a little bit more versatile, I think. Um, and then the last one, the big one here, um, the change to Huarang. So Huarang previously gave plus 10% science and culture um, to every city that had a governor in it. Um, Huarang will now give plus 3% culture and science per promotion level on a governor. Um, so this is interesting, actually, I think, because it almost incentivizes playing Korea even taller than before, um, like, and, and even less wide, um, just because you really, you really want to have as many, um, promotion levels on your governor as you can, because, uh, the, the first, like, the, the founding, or, you know, the, the recruitment, um, promotion on governors counts as one, so, uh, that means that governors have four promotion levels, so you could, uh, in theory, get plus 12% science and culture, which is up from the plus 10 before, but you have to promote governors a lot. So if you have less governors, but have them more promoted, um, this could even be better than before, but as I as, as I mentioned, like it kind of just changes the play style of Korea. Um, it just makes them want to play a little bit taller, I think. And we have uh, just a few more balance changes. Um, there were a few unit changes. The only one I'm going to go over is the one to the Berserker. Um, so the Berserker's production cost has been reduced from 180 to 160, and it now gains plus 10 strength in attacking and minus 5 strength when, when defending, and both of those are changed from plus or minus 7. Um, so I think this is a good change. It will make the Berserker a little bit better. Um, I, I literally just, uh, I, I of course just did the uh, the the leader spotlight on Herald of Norway, Um and I, you know, I pretty much trashed the Berserker because I didn't think it was very good. Uh, this this might make the Berserker a little bit more uh, a little bit more worthwhile now, um, because that means that when attacking, it is going to be stronger than a knight, and when defending, it should be I believe it'll be about equal with a swordsman. Um, so that does make it a lot more worthwhile because it's not going to be you know like worse than a knight at attacking and worse than a swordsman at defending. Um, it's going to be a little bit better than both of those, and it still does have the higher production cost, but it's not as extreme. Um, so I think this is a very good change for the Berserker. I don't know if it's going to change Herald's status too much, um, but I do like the change. I believe the other two that were changed were the Samurai and the, the Kevser. Um, they both just had uh, their production costs reduced and their uh, combat strengths increased a little bit. Uh, I don't think they're going to be too big of changes in, in either situation. And lastly, we just have some miscellaneous balance changes. So monasticism, the Dark Age policy, now provides plus 75% science in cities with a holy site, and this is down from plus 100%. Um, I think this is probably a pretty good change because monasticism could be actually like really good in the uh, like if, if you get a uh, if you intentionally get a classical era Dark Age, you can get insane science and use that to just go crazy like throughout the game. Um, so I, I do think that this is a good change. Um, and the other big thing is that uh, religion now influences loyalty. So if 
Uh, only if you founded a religion, though. Um, so if you founded a religion, um, cities following your religion will gain plus three loyalty, and cities following another player's religion will lose three loyalty. Um, so just the big things here is that if you haven't founded a religion, you're not going to have, you know, like lo like negative loyalty just for your cities following a religion. This only matters if you have founded a religion as well. And the other thing is that if you founded a religion and your city is not following any religion, it's not going to be losing loyalty. It's it, like you only lose loyalty if you founded a religion and your city is following another player's religion. Um, so I think this is a nice change. I mean, it's plus or minus three loyalty isn't huge, um, but it is enough to make a difference in some cases, actually. So uh, I, I think it could be interesting. I, I mean, it's, it's going to be nice to see how this plays out in game. Uh, let's move on to talk about some AI changes. Um, so just the big ones here. Uh, AI will now prioritize taking a city over killing a unit. Um, as sad as this makes me because it was so easy to cheese the AI, uh, th this is definitely a very good a very good change for the AI. Um, so if you aren't aware of what would happen before is, you know, say your city was one hit away from being taken, uh, um, and, but there was like a tile that you could move a unit to, if you would move like a scout onto that one tile, the AI would immediately start attacking the scout and wouldn't take the city. Uh, so it was super easy to just like cheese the AI by just keep like moving one unit out and then back in and then out and back in. And they would just keep attacking the unit instead of just taking the city, which they could like literally with a single attack. Uh, they wouldn't do it because they'd try to kill the unit instead. Uh, now they, wait, they will definitely prioritize taking the city. So I think that's a very good fix. Um, in addition, the AI will now properly focus on certain yields, um, so this was actually caused by like a typo whenever they were uh, like coding for Rise and Fall, I believe, um, that they misspelled yield, and it caused the AI not to like focus on any particular yield or focus on the incorrect ones, so this is fixed now, and I believe that this will fix the AI um, being less aggressive uh, towards city-states, because I believe that that was part of the issue, that they were focusing on just taking city-states, they were all super aggressive, um, but now this should fix that as well, I believe. And the last one uh, that they've changed with, prioritiz with prioritization is kind of funny. Um, the AI will now not prioritize monarchy over every single other uh, type of government. Uh, so previously, the, the, the AI would switch to monarchy, like in the atomic era, just because whatever, there was a bug that they would, you know, like switch to monarchy because they really loved monarchy. Um, that won't happen anymore. So once again, a pretty good change. Um, another one that I really like, free city units will now will stay in their territory unless they're like particularly attacking a unit. Um, so that's very nice, because if, you know, one of the stupid AI goes and settles a city, like, five tiles away from your capital, and then it flips, uh, flips loyalty, and it becomes free, um, you're no longer gonna, just gonna have random units running into your tiles and pillaging your stuff, uh, they'll stay within their own territory, unless you send a unit over to go attack them, and then they're trying to chase it and kill it. Um, so I think that's a very good change. Um, and the only other thing is that, um, the AI has now improved their management of city defense units. Once again, a good fix, and it's kind of similar to their prioritization of killing units in cities. Um, the AI would previously have, like, archers or stuff walk out of a city to go try to attack your units. Um, they hopefully will not do that anymore, so once again, a very good fix. Um, up next, we have bug fixes. Um, so there's just a few here. Uh, the first one, suggested target will no longer suggest an invalid target. Um, I mean, that's not really going to be too influential to gameplay, but it was just kind of annoying because uh, this was most impactful whenever you were using ranged units. It would suggest a unit that's like that is out of range technically because of like a hill or woods or something like that that was blocking vision. Um, so it won't do that anymore. Uh, Germany's ability will no longer give combat bonus against free cities. I think that's a very good fix as well. That apparently wasn't intentional, but apparently tr uh, free cities were being treated like city states. Um, so so Germany would get bonus combat strength against them, so uh, I do think that's a very good ability, or a very good bug, bug fix. Uh, liberating a city makes it makes that city immune to your loyalty pressure. Uh, once again, I think that's very good because maybe, um, you know, someone's, like, been beaten up on your ally, and then their, their city flips loyalty. Um, if you then go and liberate that city um, from being free back to them, um, it will no longer flip due to your loyalty pressure as well, so I think that's a very good fix. And the last one here is that units are no longer expelled from a city's tiles when it flips to free. Uh, once again, I think that's good, especially whenever you're you're going on like a militaristic rampage and you have a lot of cities that are flipping. It's really obnoxious to have your units just get, keep getting pushed out and then maybe pushed into enemy tiles that you, like whoever you're trying to attack. Um, that was really obnoxious, so now they will not be pushed from a city's tiles if it flips. And the uh, the the actual last one here is uh. That uh, there's a bug that's been fixed that prevented the Immortals from using their melee attacks. Um, so, uh, Immortals have both melee and ranged attacks, but there was a bug that made it so that you couldn't use the melee attack. You could only use the ranged one, um, which meant that you couldn't take cities with Immortals. So, that was, that was quite annoying, um, but that has now been fixed. 
And now we just have some uh, some miscellaneous changes. So uh, some of the text uh, descriptions have been clarified. Uh, some of the notifications have been tidied up. And the biggest change of the entire patch, um, they have removed some of the snow from the arena. Um, I know it was game breaking. I cried every day thinking about how much snow there was in the arena. My PC literally caught on fire, took off like a helicopter because the fans were spinning so fast because all that snow was too much. But uh, thankfully... The, uh, the, 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 the glorious people at Firaxis have reduced the quantity of snow that was on the arena, so um, thank God for that. <laughs> but that is a recap of the, the, the spring 2018 patch notes. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. I have been the Saxy Gamer. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you're looking for more Civilization VI content, feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.